Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jamie Lee Coleman, uh, as you already know. Um, I'm a software engineer and developer advocate for IBM. Um, and I've been at IBM for six years now. I used to work on mainframes, which is a weird thing to start on coming out of university. Um, and then I went on to um, essentially Java stuff, uh, application servers, containers, DevOps, and then now here I am as a developer advocate. And you're probably wondering, OK, so my background isn't in JVMs. Um, but today I want to talk about JVMs to you because as a Java developer, it's something I use every day, all the time. Um, I know some tweaks and some things you can do to the JVM and things I do, but I didn't really dive into like why JVMs are important, what are the different options available and what can you actually do to optimize your code in your JVM. So those are the kind of things um, I wanted to talk to everyone about today. Um, I've been doing research all week on this, so hopefully some of the, I can pass some of that knowledge on to everyone else. All right, so some of the things we're going to be looking at today specifically. So what is a JVM? Um, how does it work and why is it important? Uh, how the cloud has changed the JVM? What are the different JVMs that are available to everybody? Um, then we're gonna go a bit deeper into like the Hotspot JVM, OpenJ9 and Growl. Then we're going to look a little bit at how, a, how picking the right runtime can affect your JVM and the code you're running. Um, then finally, talking a little bit about the tweaks we can do and what we can do to our JVM to optimize it. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about class, class data sharing and give you a demo of that working live. Then we'll talk a little bit about how you can save even me, more resources with idle tuning and using a JIT server. And then finally, on to a recap. Okay, so let's get started today. So why is the JVM important? Um, so the JVM, what does it do? Essentially a virtual JVM virtual machine is responsible for taking your application bytecode and converting it into machine's language so it can be executed. Um, how does that differ to most other kind of programming languages? Well, most other languages compile code for a specific system, but in Java, the compiler converts code for a Java virtual machine, which theoretically can be run on any system. Hence the phrase write once, run anywhere. So why do people use JVMs? Well, um, like I mentioned, they have cross-platform support. They have a really large library ecosystem. So um, in your Java, it pretty much contains everything you need to kind of create great enterprise applications. Um, great garbage collection, that's uh, something else that the JVM provides and you can tweak. Uh, it's got really powerful monitoring tools and it's proven and robust. I mean, enterprises have been using it for the last 20 years and they're still continuing to use it. For a language to last that long and JVMs and the technology to last that long is quite impressive and just shows how good it actually is. So a little bit how it works. So um, ignore my architectural diagrams. I have actually created all these myself, but essentially you have a class loader, which loads your classes. You have your bytecode verifier just to make sure your code makes sense. And then you have your execution engine. So if we kind of look at a JVM architecture a bit like this, you have your class loader subsystem on the top. You generally have your runtime data area, which is used for storage of different, um, different things. And then you have your execution engine and your uh, native method libraries. So just to briefly go over what these things do. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this specifically is because I'm going to go into a bit more in depth detail about class data sharing later on, just so you've got a kind of high level overview of how essentially a JVM works. So you essentially, uh, the class loader subsystem is kind of um, responsible for three things. So loading, linking, and initialization. So loading classes with, uh, you generally load classes with three different class loaders. You have bootstrap, extension, and your application class loaders. You then have linking, which verifies the generated bytecode, prepares, prepares all static variables and assigns default values and resolves all symbolic memory references. And then finally, you have initialization, which assign, assigns static valuables, uh, val variables, get the word right there, um, with their original values and executes the static block. So like I said, the runtime data area is really there for kind of storage. So the method area stores metadata, um, constant runtime port and code for your methods. The heap is kind of like a shared storage. So it's shared between multiple threads and that kind of stores stuff like objects, instance variables and arrays. Um, the JVM language stack, um, that is created when a thread is created and that stores local variables and it's a much more efficient than the heap. Then you have PC registers, which um, every thread has its own register and essentially, um, it stores the address of the virtual machine instructions, which are currently being executed. And then you have your native method stack. And as it says, it holds um, native method information. And one of these is created for every thread. 
And finally, the execution engine. So the execution engine, it reads bytecode and executes it. And it does that using the interpreter and the JIT compiler. So the interpreter interprets, as the name suggests, um, the bytecode faster, but it executes a lot slower than the JIT compiler. So the disadvantage of the interpreter is that when one method is called multiple times, um, the, a new interpreter is required. Whereas the JIT compiler is a bit different. So it neutralizes that and essentially, um, the execution engine will be using the help of the interpreter to convert bytecode, but then when it finds code that it's converting over and over again, that's when it will use the JIT compiler, um, which compi compiles the entire bytecode and changes it to native code. And native code runs much, much faster, um, which will improve, hopefully, the performance of your system. So uh, now we're all experts in how a JVM works and we all have a very high view of the architecture of a JVM. How has the cloud changed the JVM? So I've taken a few slides from another presentation I've done, but essentially it's all down to money and energy. So every resource we use on the cloud, um, every, yeah, we don't want to waste any resources because we're paying for every little bit we use, right? So we want, it's changed the way um, we kind of look at the JVM. So I've used this before, but this is kind of still uh, stands today. So if we're in our own data center and we don't have to worry, we've got the capacity for everything. We don't really have to worry too much about little tweaks here and there because we generally have the hardware available. Now, when we move to the cloud, um, we are freeing up more. So we want to have more control um, over basically our applications um, to allow us to a free up these these blocks so we don't have to pay for them and that allows other people in the world to utilize that resource um of course if you look at this and imagine each one of these is an application we've already got quite a few jvms running here now if we move to microservice architecture that's when we get a lot of overhead as you can see each one of these will be running a jvm um, and if we haven't changed the JVM and it's the same kind of JVM we're using for our monolithic applications, we're going to have a lot of overhead in our microservices. So imagine, it, again, back to the whole point is it's okay when we have one, um, but now we've got loads of microservices and we're splitting our applications up. Now we need to fit, start thinking about the overhead. Now, this is a problem for the people that implement JVMs and build them because um, there's lots of different metrics we generally want to track, especially when we're concerned about the cloud. So we've got stuff like startup time, ramp up time, memory footprint, response time, and CPU and throughput. But the problem is when you change one of these metrics, one of these performance metrics, it generally has a direct impact on the other metrics. So if I decrease startup time, I may lose throughput. So if I make the footprint smaller of my JVM, again, I may lose throughput or response time. So optimizing the cloud optimizing jvms to get a good balance of these metrics is tricky okay so who remembers this phone uh, my favorite phone of all time it used to last a week which was awesome um so this had java me inside and essentially um, i used to play snake on that i remember playing snake it's awesome um but essentially the requirements for java me were a small footprint because we were limited by the hardware we had available we had very limited ram or usually rom um, we had to, we wanted a fast startup and that was very difficult on these very low powered machines. We didn't want to have to wait five minutes to play the game snake. For example, we wanted it to start up instantly like it did. Um, and we want, we didn't, we wanted a fast ramp up time. There's no point you starting a game. Um, imagine playing like call of duty or something like that. And at the start, it's all juddery for the first few minutes. And it's so, and as it starts to ramp up, it gets smoother. That that's not the, that's not what we want. Um, but then if we compare that to like the JVM requirements that, are, that are, we want from the cloud, they're pretty much the same thing. So we want small footprint, fast startup time and a quick ramp up. Um, the only difference is now is we have unlimited resources essentially with the cloud, whereas with Java Me, we were we were limited by the resources essentially, whereas now we're not. Now we're limited by money and essentially our conscience of not trying to spend too much and use too much electricity. So why should developers care about optimizing our applications? Because um, even in our organization, it's, you know, optimizing these microservices and the services we have, is it going to save that much money? Well, that's just you and that's just your company. There are millions of developers around the world. And um, for example, there is 500,000 data centers are way over that now, probably. Um, and they currently consume about the land of 6,000 football pitches. So 
in regards to what developers should think about is we should be trying to save energy and every little bit of energy we save with optimizing our code, our applications, our application stack is energy saved. I mean, if we all did it, we would save so much electricity. So to put this into an example, um, if you take the UK's energy consumption, that's England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and times that by 1.5, that's the global data center energy consumption around the world. Now, it's not all doom and gloom because the hardware engineers have been coming to our rescue and been basically um, taking our hardware and making it much, much, much more energy efficient. Um, so if you look at this graph, if it wasn't for the hardware engineers um, working very hard to make their hardware efficient, we would be following the trend here and we'd be using a lot more energy than we currently are in our data centers. Um, but again, luckily, because of improvements, not only in the hardware stack, but improvements in how we, op uh, how we um, deploy our code, our JVMs, the servers we're using, everything, we have managed to br at least bring this down here and keep it, keep it decently low. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we as software developers shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be trying to save as much energy as possible as well. So what are the different JVMs available? So there's quite a few of them and there's a JVM for everything. Um, some of these JVMs are discontinued. I kind of kept them on here because I love the names like Wonka VM. I don't know what that was for. Uh, maybe Charlie in the Chocolate Factory needed a JVM somewhere. I don't know. Um, but there is pretty much JVMs for everything. So mobile, OT devices, research. Um, the LEJOS one is actually built for Lego Mindstorm Robotics, which I thought was very cool. Um, and the Maxine uh, JVM also is something to note is kind of what Graal VM is based on, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. But again, there are loads of different JVMs. Uh, these are kind of the main ones I believe that most people are using. So Oracle JDK, OpenJDK um, via Adopt, then you've got OpenJDK via Oracle. Um, you've got the Amazon version, which is quite new. You've got Azul, which is the, um, I think it's called Zulu JDK, uh, Graal VM, and of course Eclipse OpenJ9. So let's just have a brief high level look and just the history of some of these JVMs. Um, so you've got Oracle JDK, which was obviously the first ever kind of um, JVM, essentially. Um, the latest release, uh, Oracle look after Java, so the latest release is JDK 16. Um, so it's free. I think it's free for personal use, but if you're using it for commercial use, you do have to purchase a license. Um, it supports quite a broad range of architectures and operating systems, but there are ports. So you can port this JDK to other um, architectures and operating systems. Um, so Hotspot um, kind of came out of the original um, JVM that uh, Oracle and Java, uh, Oracle and Sun created. Um, but this one's open source and this one's free. Um, and it's pretty much supports the same architectures and operating systems that um, Oracle JDK does. So the Amazon Coretto is quite a new one. Um, it's based on OpenJDK and it's pretty much the same thing, um, but it's fully supported by Amazon, which is cool. And the cost, it's free to use. Um, it supports Linux, Windows and Mac OS, and it supports um, the x86, um, 64 and the Arc 64 architectures. Um, as all, again, this is not a JVM I've really come across, but it's one that um, does support a really wide range of architectures out of the box and operating systems. Um, so yeah, definitely something if you're interested to look into that, if you've got some, if you're using weird architectures. Um, Graal VM, uh, this is something that's been released quite recently, so May 2019. I'll dive a little bit into about how that works later, um, but the different architectures are x86, 64 and 64 bit. Um, and then of course you've got Clips OpenJ9, um, which was created by IBM, which was originally IBM's Java essentially, which was open sourced in July 2020. Um, this supports quite a broad range of architectures and um, operating systems. And that's because a lot of IBM customers are using lots of different architectures. So it supports mainframes, uh, 64 bits, PowerPC, um, all those kind of things. Okay, so let's look at the, my three favorite JVMs, essentially. So we've got Hotspot, which was formerly known as the Java Hotspot Performance Engine, which was a bit of a mouthful. So they probably just changed it. That's why they probably changed it to Hotspot. Um, so this was released in 1999. And essentially it was an add-on for Java, um, but in Java 1.3, it became the default uh, JVM. Um, and in 2006, this was open source. And this really is a pinnacle moment because this kind of paved the way for all the kind of open source projects and all the different JVM implementations we have today, which is really cool. Um, and basically but what it does, it analyzes a program's performance for hotspots. And that's kind of where the name derived from. So um, basically stuff that's been executed um, repeatedly. And essentially it looks at those and tries to optimize those in different ways. But yeah, the name kind of came from, yeah, generally looking for hotspots in your code. 
So a little bit about OpenJ9. So like I mentioned, it was previously IBM's Java, but it's now open sourced and looked after by the Eclipse Foundation. Um, so it spans, again, lots of different operating systems and architectures, because that's just generally what our customers were using at the time when it was being developed. Um, if JVM goes from small to large, it can handle really constrained environments and memory rich ones, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And it is used by many of the largest enterprises on the planet, so it is a pretty robust JVM. Um, and these are just some stats just to compare it to Hotspot. And this, has an, this does have enabled class data sharing enabled, which I'm going to demo later on. Um, but you can just see the performance improvements uh, by enabling uh, a simple tweak um, compared to Hotspot. So GraalVM is a bit of a different one. So this came out in May 2019. Um, it's based on the Hotspot OpenJDK. Um, and like I mentioned, it's got its roots in the Maxine Virtual Machine project. And that was developed by Oracle and the University of Manchester in the UK. And essentially what they were trying to do is, uh, uh, don't quote me too much on this, but from what my research suggested is they were trying to rewrite the JVM in Java. Um, they got a little bit of the way through it and it turned out there was so many lines to basically convert, they, they stopped. And this was quite a while ago. And then Oracle kind of took it back over um, uh, not that long ago. And uh, I think they did convert all that stuff to Java, but they had different goals. So why is this, GraalVM gets mentioned a lot. So why is it different to other JVMs? Well, essentially it has a brand new JIT compiler, which is called the GraalVM compiler. Um, it allows ahead of time compila compilation of Java applications, which other JVMs do, but this can do it into um, essentially a GraalVM native image and native code um, executes really, really quickly. And that was one of the main aims of Graal. Um, it used Truffle language implementation, so uh, frameworks, so you can enable a different programming languages and runtimes um, such as Python. I mean, it also enables LLVM and JavaScript runtime, which is cool. And um, so these are the kind of project goals for Growl. So to improve the performance of Java virtual machine based languages to match performance of native languages. And that was gonna be very difficult to do um, with essentially just a normal JVM. Uh, so that's kind of where the Growl VM project came around. They wanted to reduce startup time. So that we, you know, we, uh, there's a lot of things that has to happen in a JVM when it's starting up. So they wanted to reduce that dramatically. Um, they wanted to have it to integrate with lots of different things. Um, and they also, which is I've like the fact that you can run Python in this to allow freedom of mixing of code from any programmer language, um, which is like polyglot applications, which is a, a, a term I haven't used in a long time, but it's something I used to talk about quite a lot. So using, you know, in one application, using lots of different uh, languages to build that application, uh, which is great because different languages have their benefits and their disadvantages. So combining them all together and utilizing them to their advantages is really great. All right, so briefly just on the runtime. Well, I can have the best JVM in the world, but if I'm putting something really heavy on it and it doesn't run very well, then it, um, they, basically the, there's no point in me trying to optimize the JVM. Um, so these are the, uh, I'm just gonna talk about two that IBM and Red Hat have. So this is Open Liberty and this is the product I work on. Um, so it's kind of built for developers um, and it's generally tried to keep up to date with all the latest versions of Java and having something that is using the latest versions of Java. I mean, generally new versions of Java have optimizations and performance tweaks to make them run better. So having something that's always compatible or uh, um, with the latest version is key. Um, and also having a runtime that's cloud ready. So container optimized, designed for DevOps, um, yeah, basically small disk footprint, efficient memory usage, kind of stuff that kind of replicates what we were looking at in regards to what you should be trying, what we, the metrics you should be monitoring with a JVM in the cloud, essentially. Um, it's modular, which is kind of what we want. We don't want loads of overhead, especially when we're doing microservices. We don't want a runtime that's big and has everything in there. We just want it as small as possible and to pick the functionality we want. And that's what Open Liberty enables with. And like I said, being in the latest versions of everything will make sure your runtime, your JVM, your code is optimized and performing the way it should be. So now just a quick look at Quarkus. So Quarkus is pretty similar to Open Liberty. So you've got unified configuration, which is the same. Uh, zero config live reload, that is the same. We have that with Open Liberty. But the main big difference here is the native execution. So enabling you to basically convert or compile your code down into native code so it runs really quick. So what does that do? Oh, well, that basically gives us the ability to create images that are 12 megabytes in size and start up in 0 0.016 seconds. Uh, now, of course, that is not going to be the best scenario for everyone depending on your architecture depending on um 
the what kind of code you're using if you're using enterprise java or not it's not going to be the perfect scenario for everything but for stuff that you want to start up really quickly do a job and shut down um, it is really really useful so again back to the whole point picking the right runtime for what you're trying to do is um, really crucial and of course um, there's loads of other runtimes. So do your research, check them all out, find out what they're good and what they're bad at um, and utilize them for whatever you're trying to eat, um, build. So now we're down to tweaking the JVM. So these are the five points I personally believe are some of the main things that can speed up essentially your application and your JVM. So first of all, writing efficient code. Um, using the right JVM, JVM for your needs, which we've previously talked about, picking a runtime that's right for your application, which we, which we just talked about, um, using profiling, so really trying to get the most out of your JVM by looking exactly what it's doing while it's executing your application code, um, and tweaking your JVM, um, like we're going to talk about in a moment. So first of all, writing efficient code. So um, use primitives where possible. So another uh, a quick and easy way to avoid it overhead and improve performance for your application is to use primitive types instead of their wrapper classes. Um, so use int instead of integer, et cetera. Um, this basically allows your JVM to store these values um, in the stack rather than the heap, like we talked about earlier. And this reduces your memory consumption and the over and allows your JVM to handle it more efficiently. Um, use build a string builder rather than a string buffer. So if you're program programmatically um, adding new content to your string, uh, for example, in a for loop, you should use a string builder because A, it's easy to use and it provides much better performance than a string buffer. But do keep in mind a string buffer, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. a string builder is not thread safe. So if you are, if it's not suitable for all use cases, essentially. Um, Avoid using an iterator. So every time we run code that uses an iterator, a new instance of an iterator is created um, and that's gonna consume memory. So try to avoid using iterators where possible. I mean, for example, try and try avoid using things like big integer and big decimal. Now they're very accurate, don't get me wrong, but if we don't need that accuracy, there's no point because it'll just slow down our calculations dramatically in our JVM. Again, picking the right JVM for your needs. Um, and this is just adopt open JDK. So this is just showing you two types of JVMs that are available, the hotspot and the OpenJ9 one. Um, but as you can see, there's loads of different versions here. Um, and there's also different architecture types and there's different sizes. So if you go onto Docker Hub, um, OpenJ9 have a range of different Docker images you can download depending on your needs. So do your research, find the right JVM for your needs because um, if you're using my smaller services like microservices, then all of these JVMs are overhead. Whereas before we just have one JVM with a big monolith running on top. So it didn't matter as much. Um, again, back, in, back to pick the runtime that's right for your application. Um, so of course, if I was create, using a monolith, um, I, I wouldn't go and use Quarkus with GraalVM. It wouldn't be a suitable runtime and that wouldn't be a suitable JVM for trying to do that. Now, if I was trying to build function as a service, Quarkus and GraalVM are, would be really, really good candidates. Now, if I was looking to build a net new monolith or microservice, or my, uh, I would generally go with something like Open Liberty with OpenJ9 because that gives you full Jakarta EE um, compliance and it also can be configured to be very small. Not as small as GraalVM, but small enough to be a really good candidate for a cloud native JVM. So I mentioned profiling. So what is a Java profiler? A profiler is basically a really useful tool which enable you to monitor what's going in inside your JVM. So looking at stuff like garbage collections, object creation, method executions, iterative executions and thread executions, will allow, but while it, my JVM is running my code, I can look at things, for example, why is it taking a long time to run this method? Why did this object get, take a long time to be created? Things like that. So you can really dive into your JVM and see what your application code is doing. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's really, really cool to do it. Just to kind of see the, the, the workings of the JVM. Um, these are some of the most popular Java profilers, but Oracle Java Mission Control actually comes included with the Oracle JDM. So if you are using the Oracle JDK, um, do have a look at Oracle Java Mission Control because it is a really, really useful tool. Um, and again, tweaking your JVM. So the first thing I started to look at and I want to talk to you about today is garbage collection. But then I realized how big a subject that was. But there is loads of different things you can do to tune your garbage collector. So do go have a look at, look at some of the different ways you can tune it to make it more efficient. 
Um, using the at in time compiler is good too. And one of the, and the demo I'm going to show today is going to utilize the at in time compiler. So you will see that you that will be used, but it'll be used under the cover. And then that's part of the enabled class data sharing, um, with, which is available in Hotspot and OpenJ9. Um, also enable stuff like idle tuning, use a JIP server, and start with a minimum heap size. Now, I talked to a colleague about this the other day, and they essentially said, um, okay, so it's good that you're going to start with a low heap size and try, obviously try and optimize your application state in that heap size. But do be warned, if you set your heap size too low, um, it, it basically, if you set it too low, your application might not function correctly. Um, but creating a small heap size and trying to build an application that stays in that or is optimized to stay as small as possible is a really good way to optimize your code. Okay, so let's have a look, a little bit of a look at OpenJ9 class data sharing. And this functionality, I believe, is also available in Hotspot, although I haven't actually tried it myself. Okay, so um, a shared class cache is a essentially an area of memory. Um, it's a fixed size, but it kind of lives beyond the life of a JVM and the reboot of your computer. Um, so it can't grow in size, but when it becomes full, it doesn't just break. It just will, and JVMs will still load classes from it. It just won't store any extra classes inside. Um, and you can create, and uh, you can set the size yourself as well, which is quite convenient. Um, you can have as many of them as you want as well on a JVM. Um, you just provide them with different names. So when you start it up, you just give it a specific name and it will use the class cache that is either not, it, uh, that has already been created. If it hasn't got one created, it won't create one for you. But generally, um, when a JVM loads a class, um, it kind of goes a bit like this. So you have your class loader cache, your parent, and then your file system. But in contrast, if you have a JVM that runs class cache sharing um, or data sharing, you have a class loader cache, then you have your parent, then you have your shared classes cache, and then your file system. Um, and having basically the shared classes cache is storing all the file, all the classes that we're using to start up. And that will enable our JVM to start up really, really quickly. Um, again, really easy to get started. All you really need to do is add X, X share classes. Uh, if you want to click create multiple of them, you can then add the name and then add the cache name, et cetera. Um, like I said, you can specify the size. Um, with Linux, I think it's got an upper limit set of 32 megabytes. That's something to do with the operating system, but you can change that if you want to. Um, and this is just to show you a bit of an example. So this is just um, a, loads of different application servers running on hotspot. Um, and you can see Open Liberty starts in just over two seconds. And for example, PyArva Web is just over um, eight seconds. Now, if we turn, uh, use OpenJ9, use uh, shared classes, Open Liberty goes down to about a second. But it's not just Open Liberty here. I mean, I'm obviously advocating for Open Liberty, um, but even all the rest of the um, application servers have lost time. So this was about uh, nine and a half seconds, I think it was. And now we're down to seven. So utilize these performance benefits from your JVM in no matter what runtime you're using. And it's the same with Docker. Now, I think if you download an open J9 Docker image, this may be all may automatically enabled by default now. Um, but in regards to what I'm going to show you later, I'm going to have one that doesn't have this enabled by default. But essentially, even with Docker, it bringing down the time from about seven seconds in an open Liberty image down to just over two. So why has Open Liberty kind of got more performance benefits in regards to this than other Java application servers? It's because we have an influence in both the stack and we've also put a lot of improvements in Open Liberty to work really well with um, the OpenJ9 at in time compiler. So a lot of work has gone in to make the OpenJ9 um, at in time compiler really, really efficient, as well as lots of other things, of course. Okay, so it's half past now, which is good. So we're going to go and run a demo. Now, just letting you know, this is an interactive demo. So you can actually follow along with me if you want to. All of this runs in a browser, in a cloud hosted environment. This is all running on the IBM cloud, in OpenShift, in uh, containers. So feel free to do try this out. The link is here. I'm gonna post, uh, yeah, so I'll leave the link here um, for a moment. And what I'll do is I'll get the environment set up. So when you follow the link, if you do want to follow along, you'll come to a page like this. So this is just a, a workshop I have. If you click on creating RESTful web services, this will open up um, an environment for you with a very simple web application with some basic um, REST endpoints, essentially. Uh, so once that's all started up, again, this is all running in containers, which is quite cool. Um, what I'm gonna do once the environment's come up, I'm just gonna clone down the sample application that into here. Ooh, let me just close these, get them out of the way. 
Okay, so clone down the sample application and in the finished directory essentially is um, the finished code. So I'm just gonna start up Liberty as you normally would uh, with Maven. And then we're going to see how long that takes to start up essentially. And then we're going to enable class cache sharing and um, hopefully it will, the demo gods will like me today and we will see the startup time reduced dramatically. So while that's doing the Maven build, uh, I'm just gonna go into the source directory into the Liberty configuration folder and then just create a new file. Um, JVM uh, options. So basically, this is what Open Liberty will use to load in to the JVM arguments when it starts up, but you can just load them in as JVM arguments um, as well. So just give us a moment here for this to boot up. So once it's booted up, we should see roughly how long it's taken the server to start up. Just give it a moment. Okay, now the server's starting up. That should give us a time. I'm presuming it's probably going to be about 12 seconds. Sometimes it's a bit lower. Uh, and while this is doing that, I'm going to add into here. Um, so this is all you need pretty much, X share classes. That is all you need to get started and that will enable um, essentially this thing. So 12, yeah, 12 seconds, okay? So I'm going to shut the server down, control C. I'll save this file. So this will be now be used as the JVM options when the server starts up. Now with class cache sharing, the first time you run it, it has to do a cold start. So it has to populate that cache essentially. So I sh we shouldn't see um, the startup time reduce too rapidly. But then when we start it up for a second time, we should notice it drop um, dramatically. So the graph I showed showed you start it starting in around, I think it was two seconds in a Docker container. So let's see if we can replicate that. So now hopefully our cache has all been populated. And if we run it again, um, we should see the JVM tweak we've just done live in action and hopefully start our application server up much quicker. Aha, 2.2 seconds, if you can see here. Um, so, you know, as a developer, that doesn't really make that much difference to me. But overall, imagine if everyone tweaked their Java applications around the whole world just to use this one tweak, how much resources, how much money, how much energy we would save. Um, so I just wanted to briefly show you very quickly um, just how easy it is to um, essentially use these tweaks and, um, yeah, utilize them. Right. So back to our presentation. Uh, I'm just going to cover a couple more things to finish off. So a little bit about what idle tuning is. So this is enabled um, by default in containers. And essentially a lot of VMs that we have running, a lot of containers, a lot of them aren't doing a lot most of the time. Um, so having something like idle tuning um, enabled, and again, very easy to set up, and it's default setting in a container for OpenJ9 anyway, um, it allows the JVM to have a little rest, let's say, and go idle um, when essentially it's not being used, which saves some, um, some resources. And then finally, onto the JIT server. So a JIT server basically allows you to offload um, completion to um, essentially JIT servers. So how does that work? So and let's first look at the benefits of a JIT server. So this is OpenJ9 and OpenJ9 running with a JIT server. And as you can see, uh, it's pretty much the same. Um, no real difference there in throughput. If we lower the memory it's got available, we can see the OpenJ9 go down a little bit, but not too bad. And, but then when we go down 50 more meg, that is when the throughput of the OpenJ9 JVM just hits the floor. Um, but with JIT OpenJ9 and the JIT server enabled, that throughput stays up pretty high. Um, and that's really good because it means that if our environments get constrained, it means our services won't just die and stop serving requests and hopefully give us enough time to sort out the problem. Um, and again, very easy to enable. So you just um, use this command here to enable the JIT server in your JVM, which kind of sets it into client mode. And then in another command, uh, in another terminal, just run JIT server. And then basically that will start up a JIT server, which will then listen um, for incoming and compilation requests. So a quick recap, I've gone through this a little bit quicker than I expected, but it's the end of the day and I'm presuming you'll probably want to get off and do stuff anyway. So that's probably not a bad thing. Um, so what have we, What, if anything, has anyone learned today? So kind of what is it to get the most out of your JVM? And these are the main points I want to reiterate. So when you're writing code, write efficient code. Um, use the right JVM for your needs because there are so many different options available. Um, pick a runtime that's right for your application. Use stuff like profiling to actually look what the JVM is doing with your code. Because personally, until probably about two weeks ago, I had never even tried to look at profiling and now I can't stop using it. 
Um, I constantly want to keep looking at what my application is doing inside the JVM. Um, and tweak your JVM, because once you combine all this stuff together, then it will hopefully save your organization, your company money, and it'll hopefully save a bit of energy in the process. Um, here's some links to some of the things I've talked about today. So feel free to um, have a look at those. And um, if you need any references to the, uh, my research that I've been doing for this talk, um, all the links are on this slide here. So thank you everybody for listening to me. I hope you've enjoyed the conference and I'm going to now hand it back over to Dan and co. Hey, Jamie. Hello. Thank you so much. No worries. I mean, I know you in the UK, you, you've got speed. I mean, you've got rhythm. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I don't that's... think that's I don't think that's a UK thing. That might just be me. <laughs> so don't 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 put everyone out. But that's a positive the thing. I mean, well, moving <laughs> moving fast, you know, faster even than the JVM. <laughs> it's uh... yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I have to admit that I I really appreciate your should I call it your green approach. Mm, I mean, thinking yeah. of every bit it, it's, we forget it. about it we're so detached from where our applications are running like we have these monstrous buildings that are just consuming energy and uh, as developers we just we're so detached from it we just don't think about it so it's just something that i always try and bring across and try and make people think about mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and maybe we we managed to strike a little bit of balance against what's happening in the in the i don't know mining space right yeah, yeah. But with all this <laughs> bitcoin thing and mm -hmm. yeah i know some people that will hate me after that, but well, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, but good point, too, because I think there's a new trend now uh, when you talk about software architecture, because we mm -hmm. have all this uh, architecture qualities, but now uh, one of them that's getting more and more attention is sustainability. Yeah. And then Agreed. even if, yeah, we have the resources, but yeah, how can we optimize so we can save every little bit count? Definitely. Um, and yeah, it, if you need more information on any of this climate stuff, I have, uh, I can provide you talks for this at any other future conference. So just reach out to me if you guys are interested or you get interested in these kind of subjects, because I love talking about basically saving electricity where I can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's something that we, we must address. It's not like optional now. Yep. So the answer is yes. We're <laughs> Um, and, and by the way, how do you see uh, clients reacting to that? I mean, how do you, uh, besides politics and besides, you know, good intentions and everything, what yep. do you see happening under the hood? So what, so Bogdan was talking, the, the, the chap that was talking before me, you were asking him a question about why essentially people aren't modernizing quick enough, say in just an example in Romania and stuff like that. And it's people are just scared to utilize new technologies. Um, they've been using such a technology for so long. They're too scared to move up to the latest version, use the latest tech and all this stuff basically contributes to us saving energy because why would we adopt a technology which isn't you know, not as efficient as an older technology. And people just, with IBM and its clients, that is a general thing we see. Now, in terms of green electricity, it's not, not something they would ever protest against because it's something that, like you said, it's not an option for us to not do anymore. Um, and it looks good on them if they can say, look, we've re-architected our application. We're saving all this money and all this electricity. Um, yeah, if they can and they have the resources to do it, it is something they want to do. It's just the resources like human resources that are required to do it can be quite massive so and as you know we're in a bit of an uncertain time at the moment so a lot of these modernization journeys may get put off for a year or two years until organizations recover essentially mm -hmm. so should we just raise the bar and challenge a little bit the engineer the software engineer in ourselves and say if you want to be called an engineer in the 2020s then you should care about Agreed. trees you're burning i mean if we're not going to who is right we're engineers <laughs> um, if we're not going to, if, if we're not going to do it we can't expect the general public to do it so that is kind of my message that we are engineers and we have the power to help essentially cool then what what other uh things do you think we should uh uh i don't know maybe promise to our audience for the next uh Java and not only Java related conferences. Uh, Jamie, what do you think? I mean, should we promise that we'll meet again at some point? Yeah, definitely. Uh, what, you mean in person? 
Um, well, I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I haven't actually attended your conference in person. I've done it virtually, um, but I have been to conferences in Romania before. So, and I do really want to come back. So, hopefully, in the future, we can do it in person. Now, I think yes. Obviously, it might be better for the environment if things are virtual. But at the end of the day, um, humans need human interaction. And with, as developers, unless we're forced into it by being put in a conference scenario, we won't, <laughs> we won't talk to each <laughs> other. If you're on a virtual conference and you're on a virtual chat, generally you won't see people talking to, to each other. And that's because developers, we're not those kind of people. Mm -hmm. um, but if you throw us all in a room together, um, and we all know this kind of same stuff. We will talk to each other. So you will never replace that regardless. Um, but if you can come up with an idea for an aircraft that doesn't use fuel, that's better. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, my, my, my thinking was quite basic. I mean, you don't have to use an aircraft or car. So you, you just start now and we'll meet in September. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll start walking. <laughs> <laughs> don't see a problem with that. Yeah. Uh, that's something I would rec recommend also to the, to the ones who, who are mining. Well, why don't you mine it by, I don't know, put by hand or whatever, you know? Yeah. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Super. But then I take it as a promise that you'll uh, come back to Code Camp in, uh, in the autumn. Yeah, yeah. Physical or virtual, I'll be here. Yeah. If you, get, if you invite me, I'll be back. 